Dawn, Tuesday, September the 13th, 1814. The mist of the early morning sky was beginning to burn away. And the quiet over the city of Baltimore, Maryland, was mixed with an air of expectancy. An expectancy of war at any moment. The expectancy made the peaceful morn icy, cold, full of consternation. But the people swore that what had occurred a few weeks earlier at the capital of the United States was not in Washington, D.C., was not going to happen there in Baltimore. Therefore, the citizenry, along with the members of the military, worked hand in hand, day after day, to build fortification to protect their homes, to protect their churches, to protect their city, to protect their country. It was the War of 1812, and Napoleon, the great conqueror of Europe, was finally defeated, and the whole might of the British Army and the British Navy was now turned upon the United States. Battle after battle had, for our country had been fought, and everywhere the Americans looked, there was defeat and there was despair. The arrogant British, the British, their peace delegation in Ghent had presented to the American delegation an ultimatum which the British, of course, knew that the Americans would not ever receive and agreed to, but that was okay because that's what they wished. They wished. They believed that America was going to be finally be taken over. They were going to lose. And the, the, the small little republic was going to simply dissipate, disappear. And also, the shame of the British for losing the American colonies and, and the uh, American War for Independence. Well, that will finally be erased forever. And the British will have restored their honor. But... Earlier in August of 1814, the armies of Admiral Sir George Cockburn and Major General Robert Ross had defeated the small American army which would protect the nation's capital, Washington. And Washington was conquered. It was captured. Once it was, the hatred of the British for the Americans rose to the surface. And with that, one of the greatest of perfidy and barbarity had occurred. What happened? They systematically burned down the capital of the United States. The great conflagration that was seen for miles and miles as the flames consumed building after building, beginning with the White House. Well, they ignited all of the government buildings, the, the, the ships, the shipyards, arsenals, storehouses, storehouses for food, the homes. The people were either killed or they were scattered, homeless, destitute, bewildered. But our God reigns. And in the middle of this great barbaric act of wanton destruction, which resembled the burning of Rome itself, came a most violent thunderstorm, which began to put out the flames. And, and after a spell, well, a tornado hit the city, killing scores of the British who had not yet completed their depredations. And they forced them, this tornado forced them to retreat in confusion and panic, as it was almost impossible for them to stand. Scores were just blown away, while others crawled upon the mud, trying to flee the city of their despair, the city of their destruction. Major General Ross decided that he was going to call for a retreat back to Patuxent, Maryland, to regroup, to reform, and to plan uh, make a plan for a similar destruction of the city of Baltimore. Well, but the shameful act of the sacking of the city of Washington stirred every American heart and solidified their resolve. The resolve to do what? To defeat the enemies of their liberty. Thus the people of Baltimore, they prepared their city and they said, if they wish to die, perish in war, better here than anywhere else. Well, prior to, prior to the Battle of, uh, of Baltimore, while in Chesapeake Bay, the British were looking for somebody, a, a, a minister, to be able to minister to them. So they chose Joshua Thomas. He was a Methodist missionary. Well, they wanted him to hold services, uh, well, for the king's troops and to encourage them. At first, he was resolved to resist. But then he thought better of it. And he thought, I feel like the Lord himself wants me to do this. So he did. 
And using the text of 1 Timothy 1.5, he said to the throng of the British might assembled before him that it was sin that made men war with one another. And he also said, the Lord told me that you would not take Baltimore and that many of you here today will die by the sword of battle. And you must heed your last call to salvation and you must make peace with your God. September 10th, Baltimore waited. Pray for peace, but prepare for war. Sunday, September 11th, a warning gun, a gun was fired. Boom! The British, they have arrived. Two arms, two arms. The British are about to attack. Well, they did. Monday morning, September the 12th, the battle had commenced. Now, in this ensuing battle, as Ross and Cockburn were following the, 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 the front portion of the army that was attacking, the advance unit, an aide rode up to them and asked them, well, where are you going to be requiring dinner? And Ross smiled and he said, tonight I shall dine in Baltimore or in hell. Minutes later, an American sharpshooter shot him from out of his saddle and he died in the arms of his aide an hour later. No Englishman that night, that day, or ever have happened, they never had dinner in Baltimore. The Americans resisted. And they resisted the, uh, the British land units to the point to where the British had to withdraw. They said, we need to have the help of the, of, of the Royal Navy in order to take Baltimore. So the Royal Navy was going to attack, except for one problem. There was a fort standing in the way of the Royal Navy. And that fort was Fort McHenry. Now, the commanding general uh, or the commanding officer, Major George Armistad, he was the commander of the fort. He had ordered a big flag to be made to fly over the fort. He wanted the British to be able to see America's defiance and America's resolve. So he commissioned the widow, Mrs. Mary Pickersgill, and a team of seven, seven ladies to sew a flag. The flag was 30 feet by 42 feet. It was the largest flag in the country. Well, at its completion, they took the flag over to the fort and they hauled it up. And to the, to the joy and expectation of the American people, they shouted huzzah and hurrah. The flag could be seen throughout the countryside. Tuesday, September the 13th, the dawn of the bombardment of Fort McHenry. It commenced. For over 25 hours, British naval guns pounded the fort with over 1,500 projectiles weighing 190 pounds. Then came the whistling of the shells, the, def the, uh, the deafening roar of the explosions, flying, flying splinters of wood, mortar, and flesh. Through the entire day, then into the night, into the night, and the rockets' red glare, and the bombs bursting in air, they gave proof to the night that our flag was still there. Through the mayhem of the exploding shells and the falling debris, ignoring the faraway look in the faces of the dead comrades that were before them, the force of the earth-shaking con concussion, the defenders stood their ground. And while fiery fragments of molten steel flying everywhere, piercing body and building alike, setting conflagrations all over the fort, the defenders stood their ground and they gave as good as they had received. But again, the Lord reigns. The Lord was good. For the rain that he had sent had caused the earth to be filled with mud, but swallowed up many of the projectiles and lessened the concussions and the explosions and turned the earthworks the, the earthworks into shells uh, into shell absorbing sponges in an american ship the young lawyer francis scott key sent to gain the release of a fellow, fellow american he was held by the british himself and he was held there in an american ship until well the expectant uh, surrender of the fort had occurred but to the amazement of all on the light of the 14th flew the gallant stars and stripes. Can you imagine? After 25 hours of bombardment, there she flew. And what did he say? Oh, say, <clears throat> can you see? He wrote, by the dawn's early light, 
What? So proudly we hail? This twilight's, the twilight's last gleaming. Whose bright stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming? Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave over the land of the free and the home of the brave? Indeed it did, and indeed it was. Key was inspired, of course, awed, patriotism, and thankfulness to God, bursting forth at the words which, jolted, which he jotted down. Words which since become our national anthem. Make no mistake about it, as, as the grounds of the fort swallowed up the deadly cannonballs of British tyranny, so did the courage and the Christian character of the defenders of liberty absorb the temptation to surrender, to give up their liberties and their freedoms. And as the flag flew defiantly, gallantly over the fort, huge, big, stately, so has the gallant heart of Americans stood brazen and unflinching over the cannons of tyrants ever since. And we must ever shall. In the end, the fort stood. The British left. The city and the country were saved. The flag which Ross hated <clears throat> and the song which it inspired has since flown over many city cities that has been liberated throughout the world. As a matter of fact, she flew over many British cities and were sung by many Britons when America sent her young men to die and to save the world from tyranny twice in one century. Thus, we should ever pray the last stanza of of our national anthem, which is what? We never hear these words, but here they are. Oh, thus be it ever, when free men shall stand between their loved homes <clears throat> and the war's desolation. Blessed, blessed with victory and peace, may the heaven-rescued land praise the power that has made and has preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must, when, when our cause, it is just. And this be our motto, in God is our trust. And the star-spangled banner, in triumph, shall wave over the land of the free and the home of the brave. Thank you. <clears throat>